Hello everyone, Andrew here, and welcome to my 2021 Game Room Tour. It's hard to believe that it's actually almost been a decade since I have made one of these, so I figured it was about time to finally make another one. Anyone who has watched my one from way back then will see that things are somewhat similar and yet not. Obviously, with the cabinets and such, it's hard to really kind of completely rearrange your game room at times, but the shelves have been slightly rearranged, and I hope that you enjoy seeing all the different things I have picked up in that time. We're going to be starting with this room here, doing it in a clockwise motion so that you can pretty much see everything that I have. Uh, you're definitely going to want to get comfy because it's going to be uh, quite the long ride, I believe, and then we're going to continue on into the other rooms where you'll find arcade machines, pinball machines, and all that kind of stuff. So, without further ado, let us begin again uh, working in that kind of clockwise motion. We're going to start over here with the NES games before moving on to the TV and then to all of the cabinets uh, working from left to right. So here we have my NES game collection, and anyone who's watched my videos in the past will know I absolutely love the NES. I am only six games short of having a complete official release uh, North American set. And of course those six releases are kind of, or rather uh, games are kind of the ones that are really up there in price these days. So your stadium events and your Flintstone surprise at Dinosaur Peak. But otherwise, I'm really happy with what I've been able to accomplish over the years in terms of collecting uh, NES games, a console that I always thought would be super cool to have a complete set for. And as with all my collections, they are pretty much always in alphabetical order. One thing about my collecting that I suppose it's very important to point out that I've never been one to kind of just run to the internet and pay top price for things. Video game collecting to me was always so much fun in that it was about going around to thrift stores and garage sales and just finding those amazing deals and just feeling so great when you snag that game that might be worth quite a bit uh, at a really good price. And that is definitely how I built up the majority of my collection. It was never just going on the internet and just kind of buying everything I saw regardless of how much it cost. And that's why I am, you know, missing some of those kind of more up there games because I always kind of held out hoping that I would someday come across them and always have that memory associated with, you know, just how incredible of a deal it was. I don't feel like just kind of going on eBay and, you know, dishing out the cash for it. But to the right of my NES games, we have one of these plastic shelves. Now, before I got all of the metal cabinets and such, which now line my room, uh, that is actually what everything used to be stored on. I have a, a game room tour from, like, way back, uh, again, over 10 years ago, uh, where... These plastic shelves are very prominent, but I'm thankful that these days there aren't too many of them in here because they are really hard to kind of nicely organize things on. But you get some random PlayStation stuff. And again, some more PlayStation things. All PS1, 2, and 3 kind of on these shelves. Working our way down, we actually got a really nice uh, Zelda uh, a Link Between Worlds standee, which was not featured in my recent standee video. I actually kind of forgot to include it, uh, but it's really neat. It kind of has like a cool 3D effect going on. Oh, which is really nice. And then back there you get some other odds and ends like the U-Force, a couple Virtual Boys, uh, the Wii controllers, which go with this Wii here. Let's put this back nicely though. And then on the bottom you get like all the kind of bootleg consoles that look like they're, they're uh, trying to be official video game consoles, but like you get that weird N64 controller, which has nothing to do with N64, a weird pink PSP thing. So those are all just kind of relegated to the uh, to the bottom here where no one will ever see them. Uh, but moving on, we have this wall here where we of course have some posters from Nintendo Power, uh, as well as some posters that would have been actually used in the store back in the day to advertise the release of games. Uh, this one I really like. I've had this forever uh, advertising Player's Choice Nintendo 64 games back in the day. And again, some other posters and such. But let's step back here and get a nice look at the TV. So you can actually play, with everything hooked up right now, 17 different types of games. We have my AV Famicom here, which I use to play uh, not just Famicom games, but also with a converter. I can play NES games on that as well. Uh, and it's just great. You get AV quality video. It's very reliable in terms of working. I've made a video all about that and how I think it's one of the best officially uh, licensed ways from Nintendo to actually play your NES games, uh, even in North America, despite the fact that it's a Famicom and not actually an NES. So, yes, with that, you can play uh, NES, Famicom, and 
uh, Famicom Disk System games, but let's just consider like Famicom and NES one thing. Uh, with this, you can play your Sega Genesis, CD, and 32X games. You can play Wii games, N64, uh, GameCube. Of course, you can play GameCube on the Wii as well, but then you can't have the Game Boy Player. Actually, I guess that's technically another console, so uh, bump that up to 18 games uh, if you want to play some Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, maybe even 19. Uh, you can play a lot of games on this TV. Uh, Super Nintendo, uh, PlayStation 1 and 2, and the reason for all the Playstations is because this one's modded, so you can play Japanese PS1 games, but later on, companies started catching on uh, that people were playing burned games, and some games had an extra level of protection. Well, you had to have, like, uh, a later mod chip if you wanted to get past that extra level of, prote uh, of protection. So this is the PlayStation that will play all of your mod, or rather burned or Japanese PS1 games. Uh, we have a 3DO, Sega Dreamcast, we have a Gemini in there that plays Atari 2600 games. Uh, this thing down here is very important for kind of uh, video splitting when I'm making my uh, Let's Plays and such. We get a uh, CDI, we get a Saturn, we get a Crystal Xbox Original, and an Xbox 360, and that's not something I usually include in the count of what I can play on this TV, because I never ever use an Xbox 360 on this old CRT TV. You really have to play the 360 on an HD TV, or it looks like garbage, but I leave it there, uh, just because it kind of looks nice beside the original Xbox, but yeah, I would never ever advise playing that on an old TV like this, but otherwise, I absolutely love still playing uh, the consoles that were made for CRT TVs, on this old TV is I think that they look pretty darn good on it. Uh, but with that though, I believe that is my TV and everything hooked up to it. Of course, there are some essentials missing. You don't get like the turbo graphics on there, which we're about to look at inside the cabinet. You don't get things like the Neo Geo, uh, but my setup just does not unfortunately have the room to have everything hooked up at once. Uh, but I have this table here that it's easy enough to kind of just, you know, grab something off the shelf, uh, plug it into the TV and have fun with it without, you know, too much effort. So moving on now, to the first cabinet, uh, we have all sorts of things in here. And one thing that people like to mention is that, you know, the things inside the cabinet do not necessarily match the sign that is on top. And I totally understand where you're coming from, but I unfortunately uh, do not have signs which correspond to every single console, nor do I have nearly enough cabinets to, like, dedicate one to each type of thing. So, yes, this is the PS3 cabinet, and uh, yes, there is, like, a lot of uh, Nintendo, Sony... Uh, turbo graphics, all that sort of stuff in there, but uh, hopefully you will you know, understand that is just not feasible to kind of you know match absolutely everything perfectly to the cabinet that it says on it. Uh, and there's of course also things on top of the cabinets as well. This has all been very nicely reorganized since the last time I did a room tour. And up here you get like the Donkey Kong Country Pog set, some other odds and ends. Uh, master system I showed, including that really weird one. Actually, that's the really weird one right there. It doesn't have like any other uh, graphics on it except for the contents of the box. But let us move inside now to this cabinet and see what we have on the top shelf. So we have a Vectrex, very classic console that tried to bring arcade action home. Uh, it's just all around very neat. It has a very funky controller and it's this massive kind of unit, uh, but it takes cartridges on the side. So there are actually a variety of the games for it. Uh, and again, there's going to be a lot of games and such that you see once we get to uh, that other room out there. So if you don't see like Vectrex games now, uh, it's because they're not obviously all going to be on the shelf along with the console. We will be seeing them a little bit later. Uh, but here is my Virtual Boy collection, including a boxed Virtual Boy, a uh, Virtual Boy complete in the carrying case, some boxed games, including the essential uh, Virtual Boy Warrior Land, pretty much the main reason you would ever want to own a Virtual Boy. Uh, and actually the reason that I bought a Virtual Boy back in the day, I was on a Warrior Land binge in 2006. Uh, and Warrior Land Virtual Boy was was the only one I had not played to 100% completion, so I just went out of my way, uh, went to eBay, which again is something I don't normally do, but back in the day I was able to get a Virtual Boy with six games, one of them being Virtual Boy Warrior Land, for $60. Uh, and then from there, I actually continued on and completed my Virtual Boy set and now own all 14 North American releases. If you want to collect a kind of small set of games, the Virtual Boy is one that I recommend uh, because it's super fun. Just be uh, a little, uh, you know, careful about Jack Brothers. It's kind of expensive these days. But here we are now at the Turbo Graphics shelf. So for Turbo Graphics, there are a lot of interesting things out there, especially if you begin to dive into the Japanese market. But of course, this is just kind of the basic uh, North American console. 
with the extremely rad 80 guys on there. Hair slicked back. He's ready to play the console that's totally radder than the NES. You get the arcade stick, the Turbo Express, so you can you know play your Turbo Graphics games wherever you go. And that was something that Nintendo did not have. Of course, Sega Genesis had like the Nomad. Turbo Graphics had the Turbo Express, but you just cannot play NES games on the go for like the longest time. Uh, but then this is what it looked like in Japan. This is the core graphics version of the Turbo Graphics, uh, and it is just super small compared to the console that we got in North America. And I've made videos kind of comparing the size of those. This is actually for the Japanese uh, second release of the Turbo Duo. Rather, the PC Engine Duo, as it was known over there. Um, and that let you play both Turbo Graphics or rather PC Engine card games and CD games. Uh, but I just found this randomly at Value Village one day. No console, but there actually were controllers over in Japan that had six buttons rather than the usual two. And yeah, just going back to the day of, uh, you know, collecting at thrift stores and such, it was always so fun just coming across random things like that. And speaking of random things, this right here, is the Super Graphics. Now this is like a beefed up version of the PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics released exclusively in Japan, and it plays some exclusive Super Graphics games along with your original PC Engine library. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the kind of cardboard cover that sits on top of it. It didn't come in like a real box, uh, but what some Japanese consoles had back in the day was just like a cardboard sleeve that slid on top uh, and like no bottom to it. And I found this out of at a Goodwill back in the day, just in the styrofoam, unfortunately. So I've always assumed that they were probably silly and like threw out the cardboard top since it wasn't technically, you know, attached in any way. It just kind of sat on it. So always been sad about that, but I do indeed own a Super Graphics and a Turbo Express complete in the box, along with a couple other things in here. But yeah, NEC's consoles, the uh, Turbo Graphics and PC Engine is super cool to collect for, uh, but definitely pretty obscure these days. You won't see stuff for them uh, too much anymore. Moving on down though, we got some PlayStation 1 and 2 stuff. Now there are a lot of PlayStation 1 consoles here, a whole bunch of them being modded or having different things about them. Like there's the one that has uh, all those different plugs on the back and then you get ones that only have some of those. Uh, and it used to be back in the day when you walked into a thrift store, there was always like a massive stack of PS1 consoles that nobody wanted. Uh, and they'd just be selling them for like super cheap. And there was always a part of my mind in the, in the back of my mind that's like, you know, it's going to be like that forever. But now they've actually become kind of obscure. So it feels weird having so many of them. Or back in the day, that was just the norm that you would accumulate a ton of PS1 consoles if you were into game collecting. Then we get things like Tyco Drum Master, uh, Beat Mania controllers, some PS2s, light guns, uh, all those sorts of things, uh, which is very cool. Moving on down, though. Here on this shelf, we have some box things. We got an Action Max console, a VHS uh, player console, which is kind of interesting. Now, the, the games are on VHS, but you have to have your own v, uh, VCR. Like, you hook the console up to your VCR and then that to your TV. So it doesn't actually, the, the VHSs don't go into the console itself. It's very, very weird. Uh, Lethal Enforcers for the Sega CD, which is pretty obscure. A couple Xbox 3, uh, 360 consoles. Now this is a PS4 that was actually sent to me by an absolutely amazing friend uh, in Dubai. And you should definitely, if you're ever in Dubai, check out Gamer Squad Store in the UAE. Absolutely incredible place to get some retro games over there. Uh, and just, yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, and that means that it is, of course, you know, the, the UAE version. And it has some really cool kind of things on the box that, uh, that describe that. But just overall, that, just incredible. That's the only PS4 I own, and it's from Dubai. So thank you so much. Uh, it's just incredible to have that as part of my collection. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things on this shelf though, just kind of random odds and ends. TV tuner for your Game Boy Advance, game manager for your Xbox, a box PlayStation 1. Uh, and then down here in the corner you get a whole bunch of kind of boxed Xbox stuff, a PS2, uh, green Xbox, and just some other Xbox odds and ends. And uh, these are the guns for Lethal Enforcer. Uh, the pink one was kind of special because I think you had the mail order in for that one, so uh, you don't see that too often. But with that, that is the first metal cabinet, <laughs> the, the PS3 cabinet, which actually did not have a single PS3 in it, but instead had PS1, 2, and even a PS4, which once again, thank you so much. Uh, that's just absolutely incredible. That's, you know, my, I have a PS4, and it's from the United Arab Emirates. It's just like, whoa. There's probably not too many people who can say that. So uh, thank you so much once again. 
Uh, and yes, that is the first cabinet complete. But let us move on now to the PlayStation 2 cabinet, which probably hilariously, I don't think has any PlayStation 2 stuff in it. It's over there. Uh, but the purple sign made the most sense kind of going at the end. Uh, and then, you know, all the kind of black ones uh, going down that way. Plus, I feel like Dreamcast, PS2, eh, they're, they're, they're kind of brothers in a way. Uh, okay, so let's move this table out of the way. And let's get on with the second cabinet, which we'll start by looking on top. And, I mean, you could kind of see it before, but you got a lot of, you know, Genesis stuff, which makes sense. Because the top shelf we're going to be looking at here is all about Sega Genesis. So, let's once again open up the door here so we don't get a glare. And you get Sega Genesis, Sega Genesis accessories, uh, the Sega Nomad, which of course, as mentioned earlier, it's a way to play your Sega Genesis games portably, which is really cool. Uh, so having that complete in the box is not something you see too often. Uh, Sega 32X in the box behind that. Uh, you also get the Sega CDX, which plays Genesis games and CD games. And then continuing on to the right, we get a Sega Genesis 3. We have a loose one here as well as a boxed one there, just a very small kind of uh, version of the Genesis released later on. Sega Channel, which was a device you could use to hook your Sega Genesis up to the cable network and download games. We got a front-loading uh, Sega CD. You definitely see the kind of top-loading one a lot more often. Sega Genesis Model 1, uh, side-loading, or rather, you know, top-loading uh, Sega CD, the one that goes on the side of the console back there in the box and just some other odds and ends. And also this controller right here, an official Sega Genesis controller with like rapid fire functions. Uh, you don't see that too often, at least in my experience, it's something I haven't seen all that much. Moving on to the second shelf though, we get to the Dreamcast stuff. And I guess we'll start off with the sports set right here. There were not many uh, console variations for the Dreamcast in North America, uh, but this was pretty much one of the only ones, a uh, black version, which came as part of a sports set. And then moving on down, uh, it's actually a lot more Japanese stuff. You get like accessories like the microphone, memory cards, fishing rod, uh, Japanese arcade stick, and Japanese console, which has a much simpler box than the North American ones. Moving on down, we get Sega Saturn uh, arcade stick, which is like right out of what you'd see in arcades in Japan. Uh, it is just like a really heavy duty arcade stick. Uh, but on top of that, you also get a whole bunch of the different color variations that you could find for the Sega Dreamcast controllers in North America. So even though there weren't unfortunately many you know, nice console variations in North America. There were actually some very nice uh, controller variations that you could get. And then we get a Sega CD front loader in the box, along with a couple of Dreamcast keyboards. Moving on down, we get Sega Saturn stuff. Now, uh, this right here, once again, uh, in North America, Sega Saturn, not too many cool console variations, but we have a light gray one on top and a darker gray one in the box, which were both Japanese Sega Saturn models. Uh, we have the first model of the Sega Saturn uh, in North America right here. You can tell because it has the weird ovalish buttons and not the round ones. And we got a wheel which takes up like half the shelf. And let me get down here. Hope everyone's enjoying the room tour so far. This time I definitely had to kind of, you know, do more of it on my own. <laughs> uh, I couldn't have anyone kind of come over and do any filming or such, so uh, hopefully the quality is turning out fine. And yes, just a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, different accessories and things for the Sega Saturn. And this time on the shelf, we got the Sega Genesis Mini, uh, Sega Master System 1, Sega Master System 2, Sega Master System 3D Glasses and a whole bunch of different accessories and such. And then the Game Gear over there, because the Game Gear and Master System definitely feel like they kind of go uh, hand in hand. And then at the bottom, you got a whole bunch of different accessories and things. You got a North American box Dreamcast, you got Japanese Dreamcast uh, DDR, you got the X-Band for playing uh, your Sega Genesis games online with friends, which I don't think it was ever you know, overly popular, but it's a thing that existed if you wanted to do it. And you get things like the Menacer. And again, just lots of kind of odd accessories and things for the Master System, Genesis, and uh, Sega Game Gear. But with that, that is shelf number two. Pretty much all Sega stuff. Hopefully you enjoyed seeing that. And it's now time to move on to the third one. Thank you so much once again for checking out my videos. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed, please consider leaving a like and subscribing as it really helps my channel out. With that said, hope to see you next time.